That's all good. And we will let folks join us. Takes a little while for them to be able to sign in. <laughs> Today you wanna Stop my phone. I know. Welcome everyone, my name is Dimitri Broxton and welcome to Indie Artist Studio. We're just gonna let folks sign in. Uh, so we'll give a few minutes and while you do that, we always start off by asking in the chat where you're joining us from. Um, if you are joining us on Facebook, which I know a lot of people like to do each week, please, um, if you wanna interact with us, I invite you to please visit Moad's website so you can click, it, the registration will seriously take you like five seconds and then you can join us directly on Zoom and that way you can directly interact with uh, Adebumi and myself. Oh shoot, that's not what I wanted to do. It's all good. <laughs> Silver Spring, Brooklyn. Oh. Pam Morgan. I can hear you are in the city. <laughs> I, know. I love it. Right off like one of the busiest intersections in Jersey. Uh. <laughs> All right, so folks are still coming in, but I'm gonna go ahead and get us started because we have so much to cover today. Um, thank you again so much for being here. So everyone, I'm actually gonna read a few statements as well as Adebumi's uh, bio before we get started. Um, thank you again for joining us. I love seeing all of these familiar names um, on, the, on the Zoom with us, and then I also see folks signed in on Facebook. Thank you so much for coming and joining us every single week. Um, so this is in the artist studio. While Moad's building uh, may be closed due to the mandatory shelter in place, you can still get your fill of art and artists of the African diaspora. Thank you for joining us every single Wednesday at one o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time, four o'clock p.m. Eastern, um, as we visit with some of our favorite artists in their studios to see what they're currently working on. It's a rare opportunity to hear directly from artists in their studios, and we always follow with an audience Q&A. So if you're joining us by Zoom, you'll see there's a Q&A box as we talk and questions come up for you. I invite you to uh, write those into that box and we will definitely get to them in the last 15 minutes. Um, please visit our website to see which artists we have coming up and you can also visit uh, Museum of the African Diaspora on YouTube to see all of the past talks. This series was made possible by generous donations by the Westridge Foundation, MOAD members, and viewers like all of you. Thank you so much. Today's talk is also co-presented co with Claire Oliver Gallery in Harlem, New York. So I'm gonna read a few statements. MOAD stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. We honor and mourn the senseless murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Tony McDade, and so many others who have lost their lives at the hands of police brutality and racial injustice, including those whose names we do not know. Even in the physical space, we also like to start off with a land acknowledgement. So as many of us are settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those who were forcefully brought to this continent, our institutions were founded upon exclusions and erasures of the indigenous people whose lands we are located. With deep respect, Moad acknowledges that even in the virtual space, our people, our work, and even our network servers are on native lands, and we thank the indigenous people of the Bay Area who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. 
now my amazing guest today. Ade Bunmi Badebo is a visual artist who creates sculptures, paintings, prints, and paper using human hair sourced from people of the African diaspora. Rejecting traditional art materials, Badebo saw hair as a means to center her people and their stories essential to the narratives in her work. Born in New Jersey and based in Newark, Badebo first gained recognition in 2015, exhibiting in her first solo exhibition at the Paul Robeson Gallery at Rutgers University, Newark, New Jersey while also earning her BFA at the School of Visual Arts in New York. Her exhibitions include Dhaka Art Summit in Bangladesh, 154 Contemporary African Art Fair in London, Minneapolis Institute of Art in Minneapolis, Untitled Art Fair in Miami, Chash Chashama, you know how to help me <laughs> Miranda Kuo Gallery, the Jacob K. Uh, Javits Convention Center in New York, Morris Art Dodge Foundation, College of St. Elizabeth, New Jersey, amongst others. She is in the permanent collection at the Minneapolis Institute of Art and Minnesota Museum of American Art and has been written about in publications such as the New York Times, the Huffington Post, the Sydney Morning Herald, Art Space, Ocula, and Afropunk. Barebo's residencies include Vermont Studio Center, Keating Foundry, and in 2017, she gave a talk at the Newark Museum speaking on the connections between Micheline Thomas's documentary, Happy Birthday to a Beautiful Woman, a Portrait of My Mother, and how her own mother has influenced her work professionally and personally. Adebumi is currently represented by Claire Oliver Gallery in Harlem, New York. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. I really am feel honored to be here. Yeah, and I also, as, as I just love to do, I want to start us off with a super duper short video um, for people who don't know your work. I just, I just think it's a really quick fast forward way for people to catch up to speed, sort okay. of. <laughs> so let's, just one second here. There we go. Since we started, we've been championing women. We are sort of dancing along a line between well-crafted, well-executed, beautiful work and very impactful, high-content work. These paperworks are made using the traditional coaching method of paper making, and they start with the black hair, pulp, and cotton, and the works become sort of like a living document encoded with the DNA, history, culture of the people that I'm interested in depicting in my work. I'm using fibers as a way of narrative storytelling. And you're seeing photos of African-Americans translated into actually bits of cloth that our ancestors wore. <laughs> yeah, um, that also included uh, a little snippet of both Claire and Bisa, who we spoke to maybe a couple months ago at this point. Um, so yeah, I think it's just nice to, to give people like a really quick um, snippet of, of what you do. Yeah, and that was my first show at the gallery at 154. No way. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. What an incredible uh, first experience with them is to go all the way to London. That's uh, incredible. H how, how are you doing? I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> I just got the food in before this talk, so my belly's full and I'm ready. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> um, so I always love to, you know, before we start um, breaking down into into looking at your work, and, and I'm so excited that we get to actually join you in your studio and see works behind you right now. Um, you know, part of me is just like, let's just go right into it. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, it's, it's always just really interesting to know. I mean, I think a lot of the folks who join us are not artists themselves. Um, and, I, and I hope there's a lot of up and coming artists or folks who want to be artists. So I always love to find out um, from the folks that I speak with, what got you started in art? And what was that? What was that magical moment, if there was one, where you were like, this is the path for me. I really want to be an artist. Yeah. Um... Well, luckily I, I had a mom who, I don't know, um, just kind of started me with art at a very young age. So I took my first art class at the age of three. 
at the, wow. at, <laughs> at the Newark Museum and we were talking um in well then the Newark Museum of Art it's now formally called um and back in you know when when I was going to those classes in the 90s they had free um art classes for toddlers and their parents and my mom had us both in those classes and my mom would make art with me and she pursued like a professional career as an attorney but she was really artistic so just seeing her create um and my mom made sure that we were like i was always exposed to to black culture black authors black poets and i was reflecting on this I'm in the city, as you can hear. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm in Newark now. Um, but um, my mom, I was reflecting on this earlier, like how a lot of my work, even now that I'm doing now, is referencing like artists and poets and authors. Um, but I think it was when I got to high school and, you know, there's all that talk like, where are you going to go to college? Where are you going to go? <laughs> and um, although I started running track at the age of seven, um, but art and track or art and athletics was always a consistent in my life. And I actually had a conversation with a track coach who was like, why do you think you're here? What is your purpose? And um, I knew it wasn't through track. <laughs> um, and um, you know, I applied to go to School of Visual Arts after going to two university, well, a community college in Maryland, and then New Jersey Institute of Technology. And I transferred to the School of Visual Arts, and that's kind of how, you know, the art career started rolling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, that's incredible! I I I feel like I'm always hearing stories about. Um, parents who nurture their, their children at, at an early age to pursue the arts and three is incredible. <laughs> yeah. um, and then also, you know, a, a common thread that, that I've been hearing from artists is, is having that one teacher or that other adult confidant that's like, hey, this, this is, you know, this is where I see you. Where do you see yourself? Um, that's, that's incredible. Yeah, you know, and I, I, no, sorry. go ahead. Oh, and like um, beyond like going to the North Museum, my mom, there was a, um, a art teacher in our community. Her name is Evelyn Graves. Um, and now she works, she, um, she teaches classes at a local gallery in Maplewood where I grew up. But um, she used to teach art classes in her basement to young kids. And I was one of those kids and I think I, every single Wednesday for maybe like seven years straight, I went to her basement and learned art. Um, so she had like a major influence. So it was it was like private training. It was like, you know, um, public art programs in the community. It was art in school. So it was like a well-rounded exposure of art and that was just always that's just always been a part of my life that is that that's i mean that is really incredible and you know and so so many so many parents you know don't encourage their parent their their child to pursue art because they're like you're never gonna make <laughs> a, a money you're gonna stay under my roof if you're an artist um so you know i i am finding that the the artists that are the most successful with their careers as an artist, they, they had that encouragement, you know, from yeah, the beginning. And I was really grateful that my mom um, saw it to be a natural kind of progression to go to art school. You know, like you said, there is a fair, like, can this be a sustainable, you know, mm -hmm. career? Can you make money from this? You know, <laughs> you're going to, be able to learn how to paint well, you know? Exactly. Um, but um, I think because it started so early in my life, it just made sense, you know, and mm -hmm. my mom was really um, adamant about when you see something and you're like in your child and me, I was her only child, you know, um, to nurture it. So mm -hmm. that was great. That's so amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to jump right in, um, you know, <laughs> 
and just talk and, and talk about black hair because that is so central to the work that that you create it's so central i mean you've got this amazing hairstyle for us today <laughs> um you know so obviously you know hair and particularly black hair is something of significance to you and so i'm just i'm also really interested in how do you I know that there was no class that you possibly took <laughs> where they were like, we're going to play with hair today. And that's going to be the, the main medium of the, you know, of the class. I'm sure you took drawing and painting and, and all these <laughs> traditional classes. So how did you go from there to hair as your primary medium? Yeah, I like, um, I always say going to SBA, it was a really challenging experience, but I believe it's like, the reason it is the reason why I'm doing the work I am um, and like you said yeah I was taking traditional well one thing one reason why I went to SBA is because they don't have a concentration and um, uh, okay so you're not painting drawing you know photography you're just fine arts um, so I was taking metalworking um, sculpture soft sculpture um, electronics, bronze casting, I was all over the place. Um, but then my core classes were, you know, like art history. And it this kind of shift in my work from using, cause I am a trained painter and um, like trained in using like clay and traditional art materials. But I was in a art history class. Um, and part of the challenge in going to SVA my graduating class, I was the only black person. Mm. Um, and I mean, like, not the classroom, the graduating class. Wow, are you serious? And we had the largest <laughs> class that year, my year, um, not even a black professor. So, you know, I'm the only, I'm the black kid, this art history class, and this is part two. So by this time, we had a full semester of learning about a white painter, a white painter, a white painter, a white sculptor, a white painter, a white sculptor. Um, and it was the first work that our, my professor presented in a slide that had a black figure in it. Mm. And this painting was Olympia by Edward Manet. And I was just like, a black person. <laughs> you know, and he described this painting as, um, like it was controversial at its time when it was presented and I was like, it has to be because of this black woman. Mm -hmm. Like that's mm -hmm. the only thing radically different from all these paintings before it that we've seen. And um, it, what was radical about it was the white woman in it, mm. um, that she was a prostitute and she has her hand on her crotch and she's looking at the viewer directly in the eye. And like, how dare you have this woman be confrontational in this way? And my professor talked, gave more emphasis of, about the black cat in the painting than the black woman. Wow. More about the lace than the black woman. Um, and because that painting was referencing a painting that came about 200 years before, it was really apparent to me in that moment how one, our absence in this history, mm -hmm. um, to how even when we are in the work, we are still ignored. Um, and three, how paintings are always, um, con or uh, will always be analyzed within this history. You mm -hmm. know, this painting was referencing one, two, one, the one that came 200 years before because it was reclining nude. So even if I were to like, as a painter, like paint a black figure, we would still analyze this black woman mm -hmm. within the context of all the white paintings that came before it. So in that kind of, you know, that moment in my art history class, I made a decision that not only um, do I not want to add to this narrative, add to this history, um, but I didn't want to even use those that history's material um, wow. because to use paint, um, even if I were to paint um, this narrative 
seeped in this black subjectivity, it would still be analyzed within this history that has excluded us. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, black hair became, because you know, our history is in our hair, it is our DNA. Um, you know, there's power that like a single strand could connect us to the continent of Africa. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, once I started thinking about hair as a material, it just, it was like, yeah, this is gonna be it. You know, like the, our hair is so connected to us culturally, spiritually, financially. Um, That's true. All these historically, genetically, um, and, and I only use human hair um, mm. that because it's really important that all the works I make literally have our ancestry embedded within it. So yeah, I, um, I you know, I get a lot of hair. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, I love it, the bag of hair. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness, wow. Now, now, now I know You've asked, you've answered this question many, many times. And I even saw you answer this question in Nigeria, which just, I, I just, I love that. I, I absolutely love that. I have, I, I have Nigerians in my family and I also, my family's also from the American South. So there, there's this thread about hair um, and, and the powers within your hair that just goes back so long. I know it goes back to West Africa. Um, where do you get your hair from? <laughs> So um, I guess it, it's always been the same kind of main two um, processes of how I get to here. So one, um, and social media becomes a really essential part of my practice because I'll put out like call for hair post or um, a lot of people discover my, or, you know, learn about my work through Instagram or Facebook and they'll message me. So I'll mm -hmm. either get like a donation that starts off through a DM or an email. Um, and if they're close, we'll meet in person or they'll come to my studio or they'll mail it. So kind of this back wall behind me with all these like squares that are kind of hard to identify. Those are Ziploc bags and envelopes from here that's been mailed to me and sent to me um, from all over. Um, the other way I get here is going directly to the source, to the barbershop. Um, okay, okay. You no, know, there's, they'll never run out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I have like a couple of barbershops, um, always focusing on like Black or Afro-Latino mm -hmm. communities. And um, I have garbage cans that I keep in those spaces once they agree that they'll partner with me in this way. And um, throughout the week, they'll sweep up the hair, throw it in that specific garbage can. I come in, grab the bag, and take it back to my studio. Um, That's awesome. <laughs> and kind of the interesting thing about that process is like the barbershop, the hair becomes sort of anonymous, right? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So I'm not, I don't know everyone who's there um, daily. My relationship is with the barber. So when I make hair with, when I make works with the hair from the barbershop, I'm thinking about that space collectively, culturally, what it means to the community, thinking like a lot about the textures, the colors. Um, and then a lot of my donations, although men donate as well, mm -hmm. um, but they're predominantly women um, because, you know, women when they're in the process, you know, they have shed hair, trimmed hair, that's the hair they're giving to me. So how I approach the work is different, whether it's a donation or me sourcing directly. Just that's, that's, that, yeah, that, that's incredible. Um, you know, I, it, it's really great to see that the hair kind of sorted in, in the back. Are you, do, are, are you, do you sort it by, by the texture, by the color? Like how, how do you go about that in deciding which hair to use as, as you're working? And, and, uh, and also to that, like, is it, is it different? Like I know as if I go to paint, if I use one brand of paint, it's going to feel different than another. Do, are, are you finding that with hair? Like I'm so interested yeah. or is it all pretty similar? Well, no, it, it does. Um, 
I do think of like every texture, every color as if it's it, a different paint color, right? Mm. Um, so like, you know, like this is um, my god sister's mother's, um, you know, locks. So what I could do with wow. this box is a lot different than what I could do with, you know, like say this here. And even within this here, like this becomes almost like a new material because mm -hmm. of its color. And then, you know, this is redder. I have like here like falling on my lap now. Um, but the, the different texture allows me to do certain things. So where a kinkier hair may be easier to sculpt with, um, mm -hmm. where a looser curl pattern may, I have to deal with it in a different way. So depending on the color, the texture, whether it's locked, whether it's um, short, whether it's long, they all kind of inform the work. It's like having different materials. Um, mm -hmm. Now, 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 as as your background, did where did you ever do like style people's hair? We we've spoken <laughs> to a couple other artists at the museum. So um, a couple months ago, I spoke with um, Shaniqua Brooks, uh, who's based in Chicago, and then um, we've we've shown Angela Hennessy's work. And you know, for for you. You, when you were talking about it, it, didn't, it doesn't seem like you necessarily grew up in the beauty shop and, and kind of had that connection. Um, did you did you always do hair? <laughs> or, well, or kind I don't of play know how to cornrow, which is <laughs> like, I can't even make a cornrow. Um, I could braid like a box braid. Um, but I really do use the hair as art material. Like, mm, okay. I feel like we already reference is you know it is here so I the things that I implement or how I shape it is really more more informed by um different histories right now mm. I've been thinking a lot about land my relationship to this land meaning my relationship to this country um kind of um how our relationship with our, with the land or our body kind of transforms. So I, I, I guess um, the work is more informed by these ideas. Um, you know, right now I'm thinking a lot about land. So mm. the hair is in that conversation, but I think in addition, because it is black hair, because of how I got it, you know, because of, you know, what it represents, it's innately gonna talk about these other things. And that's also why I predominantly work in abstraction. Um, mm, okay. To me, like black hair is political. You know, black mm. hair is loaded. You know, um, it's interesting when you take, to take a line and make it curly, it becomes politicized, right? If we, if we think about, you know, the context of art. So I don't need to make kind of these literal kind of mm -hmm. um, gestures or forms. Um, abstraction kind of gives me room to layer ideas, um, to talk about um, a multitude of things. Um, and then in addition, you know it's black hair. Like when you see the work, you know that you're looking at us, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's already in there. And then, Literally, black hair has information in it, and I like to feel that I I use that as, like that becomes a material. DNA becomes a material. Mm -hmm. but, so that's inc <laughs> that's incredible. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I just I love I love how you are thinking primarily of it as an artistic tool and and incorporating um, sculptural elements and 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 abstraction in that. Um, I think that that's something that really sets you apart from any other artists. Um, and kind of on that note, I think we should dive in and start looking at some of this work. Um, I primarily am gonna focus on the images that you shared with me because okay. you're, you're the best curator of your work that there could possibly be. So <laughs> um, let's see, let me get this in the middle of the screen. Uh, let's see, let's just get past that one. All right. Yeah. 
I have that work in the hall, not hanging. But yeah, that piece is called Am I Still Dreadful? And that was kind of an early piece. I started working with hair in 2015. I think that was in 2015. Mm. Um, but this is an example, I guess, of a piece where the hair informed the process, the process informed the title, like everything was connected. So this hair um, belonged to um, my track coach growing up. Um, no, no way. Yeah, um, Andrea Johnson. And for most of my life, well, you know, yeah, most of my life, her hair was in locks. And um, she said she was giving me her hair. So I'm expecting like, oh, I'm going to get a bag of locks. And I got a bag of loose hair. So what she did, she combed out her locks over oh, three wow. months. And all the hair she gave me was all the shed hair from that process. Um, so I was thinking a lot about what the hair used to be, you know, locks and mm -hmm. what it is now, this loose form. And um, so I felted the hair back together and it kind of takes on this other kind of locked form, this abstracted lock form. And the piece is saying, well, am I still dreadful? Kind of posing mm. the question now that I'm in this locked form again. Do you see me as dreadful? Which speaks to the history of why we call hair like this dreadlocks in mm. this country. You know, when um, Africans were brought here in, on, through the Middle Passage, their hair would mat or just the conditions of slavery not having ta time to maintain our hair. Our, if our hair would mat, the slave masters would say, look at their dreadful hair. And that kind mm. of started this language of calling, you know, dreadlocks. So that kind of piece is re referencing that history and um, just what, I, you know, Coach Johnson did with her hair, you know, by taking locked hair and unlocking it really kind of informed everything else. So, so was this while you were in, in, in art school that, that you created this piece? Yeah, I made that piece at while at SBA. And, and so this was kind of your first foray. So, so was this in the context of a class and <laughs> like, boom, here we go. Like, how, how, did that, how did that whole thing come about? Because I, I, I mean, that just seems so revolutionary yes. in itself. <laughs> so. Yes, so like when I actually made that decision to use black hair, I still had other mandatory classes that had nothing to do with what I could do with the hair. Mm. So I think I made that decision early junior year and the entire junior year, I just collected hair. I didn't know wow. what I was gonna do with it, but um, I collected hair from neighbors, from barbershops. The first barbershop I went to, Razor Sharp um, Barber Lounge in Maplewood, they were my first kind of um, donors. And I did a lot of research. It was really important to me that the work was informed by a real history of our relationship with our hair pre-slavery. Um, so mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. found this book called Hair Story, um, Untangling the, the Roots of Hair in America. Um, and that book starts in Africa. And it kind of talks about our long relationship with our hair from that point. Um, and I remember like at the end of my junior year when I had to show my work, I had just bags of hair and my teachers were like, <laughs> you're taking electronics? You know, like how does this relate to the classes you have? Um, but I was, I knew going into my senior year that my senior thesis will revolve, was gonna revolve around black hair. And I, I started my junior year with trying to inform myself and just collecting enough material. Um, and so there was, you know, a lot of the first pieces are informed by like this history of our relationship with our hair. It's incredible. Um, I, I, I threw in a sneak uh, image in here because it, it, blow, it blows my mind. Um, so high top. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, and for me also, um, I'm, this is an earlier work as well, right? 2017, I believe. 
Um, and, and I, well, first of all, I love seeing um, the, the Barber Clippers below. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think you're, you're, you're in, in that other, in the first piece, um, we really see, it, it looks like hair directly from someone's head. Like it could have just been cut directly off and, and you see the, the human element in there. And for this one, it's like, you're really going into this sculptural, very abstract, um, it's not immediately recognizable as hair, though I can, you know, we can clearly see it. Um, so I'm really interested in this one and I love the title. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this piece, no, this this came like after I graduated from SBA, but um, the thought process started while in SBA, you know, being the only black person in that space, um, sometimes I say I had a Glenn Ligon moment or a Zorro <laughs> and, you know, I feel most colored when thrown against the sharp white background. I was having that experience. Um, and like when you're in that space, you become hyper aware of audience. You become hyper aware that the people that are critiquing you, um, that don't are understand. Your studio that are coming to the shows are white. Mm -hmm. um, so the work started getting larger. Um, it started becoming more th three dimensional um, in this kind of strategy to like take up more space. So this was kind of the, the in between piece where it was like coming off the wall, but still in relationship to the white wall. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But yeah, like I actually did this piece over where it's about another, what was that? Another foot taller. So it wound up being like 10 feet tall. Wow. And the idea where one, it's literally forcing you to look up to black hair. Like as you experience it, you're looking up to it. And two, it's starting to evade space. And I think like works after that, I really started pushing the hair to be more sculptural. But, um, you know, just like I said, being aware of audience and who was consuming the work, I wanted the hair to always, or the piece, our bodies to always maintain this authority that you walk around it, you look up to it, mm -hmm. you know, it's taking up space, it's nappy as hell, you know, <laughs> all these things. Um, so that was kind of like my passive aggressive way of dealing with. Um, I think it's <laughs> brilliant. Oh my gosh. And given, getting that, that explanation is extremely brilliant. And I love that you even picked 10 feet. Um, I'm an Erica Badu fan. And so I think of her, <laughs> her song where she's talking about I'm 10 feet tall. Love it, love it, with the Afro. So, you know, there's so many amazing connections with that. I think also that the texture of it really, I, I, I see it in the, more, in the current work. So, you know, it, it's almost like we're seeing how you're starting to investigate the material mm -hmm. and how you can go abstract and, and how you can work with it. Um, and I would place like, sometimes a friend, when I would get here from the barbershop, I would get little razors in the garbage bags. Mm. And like, so that piece has like razors and, um, you know, I think every black person experiences, you know, moment where you, your hair is touched without your, <laughs> without your consent. And mm -hmm. it didn't stop, even though this was art, you know, like no one would ever think, I mean, people, um, you know, they, they, I've seen people touch paintings, but they're mm -hmm. like kind of this they know not to, but it was interesting, like, this hair is art. Are you still going to touch it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I would stick razors, like, you know. <laughs> touch it, touch it, touch it, touch it, touch it, I love <laughs> yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. um, now, you know, with this image, now we have this move to image with with printing with paper making um and it's just oh 
I do want to touch this. I just have to admit, I want to touch it. I want to live with it. I just, you know, and I want to know the stories. I want to be a part of it. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So this piece is called, um, and don't you forget it. It's like kind of line my grandma always says, if you ever met my grandma, you know she always says that. <laughs> She's actually the bride in that photo. And everyone to, I guess that would be the left of her, her um, now deceased ancestors, but um, her husband, my grandfather, and my great, great grandmother, because that was my grandmother's grandmother. Mm -hmm. And then to the kind of bigger image is um, a great, great uncle, um, William. So I started getting into I guess this was from a series where I was taking hair, um, making it into sheets of paper um, and printing images of my ancestors and family on it and all kind of ancestors that lived um, in the 1800s, early 1900s. Um, so this was like a part of my, an my ancestor history paper series. And it was like, it came, I started, I guess, shifting, like after I had like kind of, and I still like working sculpturally, but I kind of started using hair and to make paper as this idea of like archiving, this idea of creating history paper. And then this, I kind of see it as like a double portrait where not only is this, there's like this, um, representational portrait of my ancestry but even the sheet is another portrait and layer of ancestry um so i did like a, a series and i'm working on another now um of these kind of ancestor portraits that's incredible that's that's incredible is your own hair incorporated or, or family hair no i have a um I do have a print. My dad let me cut his hair once. So <laughs> hair from that cut, I made his hair into a sheet of paper and my brother's hair is in that. And then I printed my grandfather's image. So it's like this three generation. Yeah. My brother um, hair is sewn on top of my dad's hair and then my grandfather's image. Um, mm -hmm. I think I have another piece with my me and my sister, my sister, you know, me and my sister's here in it. But mm -hmm. um, this was mainly here from the barbershop. And there's like a textual reason why um, barbershop hair is more ideal for paper making because the fibers are just shorter. That um, makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Just kind of, I know a lot of like in paper makers would use um, fibers that are longer because the bind is stronger. Mm -hmm. But I'm taking hair and I'm pulverizing it into like a mush. Um, I don't know if you can see my like Vitamix in the background. <laughs> I did see that. I, did, I was wondering. <laughs> I was like, maybe she makes smoothies. <laughs> um, but yeah, I like pulverize the hair. So the shorter the strand, it's just easier to get that mush texture. And I um, kind of lay it out to this platform that allows me to add these um, these prints on top. That's wild. Okay, so so you're completely transforming it, and by by doing that, um, I, I you know a question that that I, that I think about, um, you know, as, as you were talking about that, I was thinking about the questions of you know, obviously you probably wouldn't want the piece with your family's hair to enter into the market. Um, you know, what is when 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 someone gives you their hair is do you guys ever have a conversation about you know it going to the gallery and entering the art market and that's yeah. that that that's a curious <laughs> that was like kind of a big shift like especially when i got signed to a gallery like realizing that like oh i just sold kelsey you know <laughs> <laughs> i just sold, you know my brother um and then there's kind of like, especially because the work is going into like institutions or collections mm -hmm. where people, you know, people want to preserve the work. I think it's 
a beautiful and kind of interesting thing that there'll be whole museum departments or collectors that will now have to care for our hair. Mm. Oh my God, I love it. That is so poetic. That, you know, like that a museum has to learn about black hair and mm -hmm. learn how to care for it for as long as that institution is open. You know, this idea that it's for, you know, the care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. like you have to care for me, you have to acknowledge me, you have to preserve me, you have to archive me. Um, and I think, I think one of, you know, cause even with people knowing that I have a show coming up, they're like, I'm like, you're gonna be in the show. And I think people, um, appreciate like the work because of that, that mm -hmm. they could um, go to a museum or go to a gallery space and we're not seeing a representation of them. They're literally seeing them. Yeah, you know, yeah. That, that Nichelle is like, that's my mom. Um, wow. Or Kelsey could look at a piece and be like, oh, that's me. You know, or um, Louisa could look at a piece and be like, I could tell that's my hair because of the texture and the color. Um, you wow, know. that is incredible. <laughs> I'm sure conservation um, <laughs> departments are freaking out. They're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> new media, we have to figure this out. <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah, it actually was, I don't know if I should say this, but like my first like print, I was experimenting and I like threw like a napkin in there to like as like part of the pulp to just see because I'm uh -huh. experimenting like is this gonna work um so yeah the first print was like not very archival um but you know like later on I upped my technique and <laughs> that's I mean that's the life of an artist uh you have to experiment with that and conservation staff just have to learn <laughs> um I, I do want to, because we're, we're getting close to the Q&A, so I just want to remind folks in the audience to please drop your questions to the, into the Q&A, and we will get to them in about five minutes. Um, so I want to get through through some of these as well. I, I always run out of time. I always need two hours or more. <laughs> but this 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 piece, Dada, um, is, is fascinating to me because it's a total, it's also a very sharp departure. Um, you still have hair, um, but it's just very, very different. And it's uh, funny that you formally. called it departure because that was my very first hair piece. Oh, was it? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, incre that's incredible. Um, the, you know, the way that it's playing with the light and the lines and the shadows. Um, but I made wow. this thinking a lot about like, this idea of it's forcing you to look up to black hair like that, you can't really tell, or maybe you could by looking at like where the lights mm -hmm. are and the piece even goes beyond that. It's like about 20 feet high. Um, mm -hmm. And I was playing around with titling, you know, like I was really aware that there will be one audience that would hear Dada and think of this art movement um, mm. where it was about questioning what can be art. It was about a rejection of, you know, traditional, um, you know, just the period of, of questioning. And then I was also aware that there'll be another audience that would hear Dada and know that it's referring to like Dada, um, which is like locked here in Yoruba. Um, and there's the Arisha Dada, and there's this idea that if a baby is born with locked hair, that they are Dada, that their hair is sacred, it's special and you don't cut it. So um, speaking to kind of these two audiences, um, you know, was informing the title, informing how I thought of the work, you know, the fact that it is the tallest thing in the gallery, it is close to God mm -hmm. and you do have to look up to it. And, um, you know, just this really beautiful minimalist form, a line. Oh my goodness. All right, you just like added 20 layers to that. <laughs> and uh, more into the, into the, to the work of paper. Um, and I don't think the document needs much explanation. I think, you know, I, I hope that folks can quickly, you know, 
figure out what, what is going on here, but um, in case they're not. <laughs> yes, so I've been working on a series called True Blue. And right now I'm looking at two True Blue plantations, one in Fort Mott, South Carolina, and my family was enslaved on that land, um, and one in Pauley Island, which is now True Blue Golf Club. Um, oh, wow. So that <laughs> is kind of the, um, a page from the will of one of the enslavers of True Blue, um, Polly Island, where he lists his human property. The names aren't there, but you see the age and mm -hmm. their place. Um, so I've been looking at these, both of these True Blues, which were indigo and rice plantations in South Carolina, as a point of com um, like comparison, because one history has kind of been erased through this mm -hmm. other white space, right? It's now a golf club, um, like this kind of white space of leisure. Um, so like there's, in that I like reference the architectural drawings that converted True Blue Plantation to True Blue Golf Club. And then the other True Blue, the history is kind of been erased, especially if it weren't for the work of family members like Jackie Whitmore, who's been doing a lot of work to preserve the land, but it's that history is kind of being erased through natural, through how the land is growing. You know, mm -hmm. my family is still buried on True Blue um, Plantation in the cemetery that was used in slave time. Um, and it's just overgrown by grass and trees and weeds. Um, so like Jackie Whitmore and other family have been doing a lot of work to to preserve the history, to reclaiming that history. Um, so I've been through paper making using indigo and mm. cotton and hair and the color blue in rice paper. So all the archives are printed on rice paper, kind of telling these two stories of these two true blues like what the land used to be, what it is now, how the history is erased, how it's, um, you know, using the materials of the land, kind of, you know, this amalgamation, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> of, <like, laughs> um, of just all this information kind of sucked into a sheet of paper. Mm. Oh my gosh, that's... That's wild and and i may have mixed up some of the images that that you sent me um this is c yeah. connected yes yeah, so that's um mm -hmm. that's um kind of a installation of true blue at the daca art summit uh before well I, I don't know why i did that for before covid but like i got that show in before you COVID. got it up <laughs> like it was in february um, that's awesome i mean hey that's a huge accomplishment <laughs> And like, like air lines were starting to back out. I'm like, I'm going, I'm going. Yeah, um, yeah. Kind of sidetrack. But yeah, no, that was an installation of True Blue at the DACA Art Summit. Um, and you could kind of see, and I have like. I think you sent me a couple of close-ups, but yeah, yeah. Where my studio? Some? I mean, like, so. <laughs> Why not? Some of this, these archives start in like this form where you see like. True Blue Plantation. Oh, I have a lovely assistant. Um, <laughs> you know, the different names and the text. So they start off and I make these sheets out of cotton and then they're adhered to um, the hair paper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kelsey. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Now, now, you know, thinking about indigo, was your was your family did did your family have a history um, with being indigo farmers and producers? Well, they were enslaved on the indigo plantation. Mm -hmm. True Blue was an indigo mm -hmm. plantation, so you see a lot with indigo plantations on the lowland. They would produce rice, um, mm -hmm. and then on the highlands they would produce indigo. Um, so. True Blue produced like an average of like 700,000 pounds of rice per year, all cultivated through human slave labor. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, when they weren't working with the rice, they would work in indigo. Um, so, you know, 
I actually, I read, I was reading about kind of just different histories of how we as African people have used the land for our liberation. Like when you think mm -hmm. of the Haitian revolution or how the land has been used as a form of oppression against us. And I started thinking a lot about my relationship to this land. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting one to know, well, it's not interesting, like, you know, it's common, you know, my history started on this plantation, but also that my relationship to the color blue mm -hmm. you know, as an artist was one of violence and enslavement of my ancestors. Um, so that's why like blue, you know, a lot of the work before this series, as you saw, like the color is whatever color the hair was. So mm -hmm, this was mm -hmm. kind of the first time in my practice where another color is being added to the hair. Um, and in this case, it's blue as it references this history. You know, that's that's incredible. I don't know where I was reading or watching a documentary, but, um, you know, I think it would be interesting to, I, I don't know if you've looked into the history of it, but I have somewhere very recently read that a lot of the enslaved Africans that were brought to work on indigo plantations actually came from Nigeria because Nigeria had such this long deep history of yeah. um, working in indigo so you know and I'm glad you brought that up because um and if COVID didn't happen I was planning on going back to Nigeria to learn the dairy process of using mm. indigo but in yeah exactly through doing research I I was learning that um, I'll just give a quick story. Like I did, I had a show in London, and I there was the price of two thousand dollars per person per enslaved person listed on this will, and some woman was like, two thousand dollars is a lot, which like <laughs> you know. But in the context mm -hmm. of that, the Africans that knew how to use indigo because of their long history mm -hmm. and culture with that um, dye and that process where they were sold at a premium mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they could transfer that knowledge and that history from those countries like Sierra Leone and Nigeria and Senegal and you know what is known as like the rice coast countries and transfer transfer that to the plantations in the Carolinas in Georgia. And I think it's really important to like note that because mm. if you have a system that says we're not human, we have no history, um, we have no culture, then how can you depend on their history, their knowledge, their culture to create your empire? Um, so I've been, you know, more and more kind of not just using the indigo but trying to be more intentional about the techniques that i'm bringing into the sheet so like is it a dare is it shippo? you know so mm -hmm. that this history in this kind of i almost like to think of it as like i'm tapping into memory um but you know this history that we have with this material is present you know kind of, you know, creating my own, tri you know, triangle. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. I'm, and, and I can, you know, I can already envision all the places you can go with that because, oh my gosh, it's deep when you're thinking about um, American history. Uh, I'm just trying to see if anyone has any questions and, um, before I jump in to any more. Um, and I, I invite folks, we still have a few minutes if you want to, um, we definitely can. But I also you know, wanted to also spend a few minutes to find out what you have coming up next. Um, yeah. I know things are uncertain right now as, as you know, museums and galleries are not yet opened um, or slowly opening in some cases. But yeah, what what's 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 next for you, or what what do you want to manifest? Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I guess I'm. I feel really blessed that I still have a 
a show that I'm working on, you know, a lot of, and even me, you know, I was affected, a lot of shows of mine were canceled, but um, I do have a solo show, my first New York solo show in New York. Ooh. Um, will be on September, as the gates go, will be on September 12th at Claire Oliver Gallery in Harlem. Um, yes, yeah, so I've been making a lot of new work that is um, kind of rooted in this series that I've been um, working, you know, the True Blue series. So, but it'll be a lot of new pieces. So it, outside of the grid, which I've been getting a lot of attention for, I'm doing more, like there's some to the side of me I did. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there'll be large works and really small kind of intimate works. I'm going to have a sound piece. Um, oh, I love it. The work that I did before here was a sound installation. So I feel like I'm just, you know, getting back. Bringing it all together. Yeah. I yeah. love it. Yeah. And then um, I'll be exhibiting at 154 online. <laughs> Woo! -hoo, that's awesome. That is a huge achievement. Yeah. Um, I do have a question that just came in from Namita asking, um, or, or, First of all, saying that you have beautiful work. Um, how do you put the hair on the surfaces and how long does it take? Yeah, so, um, like the high top piece, it is on canvas um, and that's sewn and attached through like with a, a, like a gel medium. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of the works that you see are not attached to anything. Um, so the paper, is literally cotton and hair made into a pulp. And then using the traditional coaching um, paper making technique, the, the pulp is made into a thin sheet and then that sheet is dyed. And then on top of the dye are the images. Um, so it is, and even like the Ancestor series, like it is hair. Um, mm -hmm. It's not attached to anything. Um, it's, it's part of it yeah like I have this like little bowl thing I made <laughs> this is here. and it was like I wanted to make something um three-dimensional and sculptural like how do I make black hair sculptural without an armature without being attached mm. like that answer so I'll be making more of these I call them like vessels um but yeah the hair is sewn or made into pulps or shaped into sculpture it's just here that's incredible. Um, I have another question in here where someone, and I'm assuming because they, they may want to do this, it's an anonymous attendee, um, also wants to know how can one go about donating hair? And I'm assuming they may want to be part of, it, <laughs> of your work. Yeah, so I, I think she's just helping me get it out, but that's a good friend and she's donated hair. But <laughs> <laughs> actually her hair is on the wall, but um. You could, um, my Instagram, like Ade Booms, A-D-E-B-O-O-M-S. Um, a lot of people will reach out to me through Instagram. Um, my email is my first full name, studio at Gmail, um, or like my website. Um, some, I recently had um, a woman, Monica, um, who works at Curls All Out. And mm -hmm. her salon, she works at a, a black hair salon and they just had so much hair and they felt guilty about throwing it out. So now I part, um, she contacted me and that huge garbage bag is all from her salon. That's one place. Wow. Um, so wow. Their salon, I like to think is like, I'm in partnership with, um, so yeah, just reaching out to me in all the different ways that I exist online. <laughs> Um, then, you know, I, it, it's, I, I love, I love how you enter into partnerships with the, the people and the salons. I think, you know, there, there, there's just, there's just something about that, that, that just seems very, um, you know, there, there, there's a gratitude there, there's, there's, there's a, a mutual respect for each other in that process. And it's also like this reality that like, there would be no work without my community. Mm -hmm. Like literally, mm -hmm. like literally, like there's times where, like even right now, you know, like I have work to make, but mm -hmm. it won't 
nothing could happen if I don't have the hair through donations or the barbershops. Um, so even the pace or the amount of work or what I could produce is all dependent on, you know, that my, yeah exactly my community um black people um which i love like that structure of how the work comes to be mm -hmm. yeah. and on that note i thank you so so much for this beautiful conversation for opening up your studio for us and telling us so oh, much Oh my gosh, we could have really just spent all day walking around your studio. <laughs> and I have things in the hall, I'm like, ugh. <laughs> Every studio I've had, I've like spilled out of my studio. I'm gonna, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you so, so much. This has been amazing and I cannot wait to see what you do next. Um, yes, we do have so many people on Facebook. Yay, <laughs> hey, everybody. Sorry we couldn't directly interact with you, um, but please make sure that you follow Adebumi on um, Instagram and on Facebook. Um, also check Claire Oliver's gallery and Claire Oliver, thank you so much for um, sponsoring and uh, or co-sponsoring this with us. Um, thanks to Westridge Foundation and thank you Adebumi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a beautiful rest of your day. You too. <laughs> Bye everyone. See you next time. <laughs>